I want to share this morning uh, briefly, and uh, what is your purpose? I think it just fits in really, really well with where we're going. In the beginning, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. That's in Genesis 1.26. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Whether you know it or not, but you are a spirit being. You are a God kind of person. You are here with a reason. So, Father, we ask you today that we, your people, would find the purpose, the reason that we're on this planet in this hour that we're living in right now. And, Lord, I'm praying that by your Spirit you'll quicken to us that we might get up off our blessed assurance, grab hold of the promises of God, and go forth and become the people that you want us to become. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. And everybody said... Amen. The fall of mankind separated man from God, not God from man. We have never ever been separated from God, but the fall separated man from God. And we were lost and we needed a savior. God, man was lost in and, and, and his sin and goodness knows what else. But I believe that when this fall separated us from God, mankind lost his right standing. Everybody say right standing. Lost his right standing with God. That's in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. It tells us the story of the fall. Jesus came to earth with a purpose. He said for this purpose was the Son of God made manifest. But I tell you that's not the only purpose Jesus came for. Jesus came to this earth with a purpose. He came to earth to give his life so that we could get back into righteousness. So we could get back into right standing with God. That which was lost at the fall, we lost our right standing with God. And Jesus came to restore that with God and, and also uh, to tap, for us to be able to tap into his supernatural power. You see, if you were made by God, if, you, you, if God created you in his own image, in his own likeness, God is a creative God. God is a supernatural God. God just spoke and, and he fashioned the worlds out of nothing. He created out of his words and is a supernatural God. And you see, when man lost that, he lost that supernatural power. And when Jesus came back, he restored that. One of the great difficulties humanity has today in the church is understanding what Jesus really did for us and how he restored back to us that the power, the anointing, the, the, the ability to be able to, to speak into a circumstance. Right throughout the scriptures, he's always saying, whatever you ask in my name, you can have. You can speak to the mountains. You can speak to this and they will be removed. And man has great difficulty with that because you see there's a law it operates in, the human, in, in natural man. It's called the natural law. And when God speaks to us supernaturally, we ha it has to filter through that natural law. And by the time it comes through that natural law, it's lost its power. God came to deliver us from that natural law and set us free so we could be everything that God wants us to be. Be able to tap into his supernatural power. Jesus came to show us God's mysteries. He came to show us his majesty so we could touch him and be made whole. One of the amazing things as Bob was sharing there and just on, on, on kids there that have, that have been right at that edge where they're ready to topple over into a life of destruction. Already they've been programmed and things like that. Jesus, when he comes into your life, just doesn't give you a band-aid to put on you. Just doesn't give you a, 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 a ring so you can swim in amongst the sharks. But he wants to deliver you out of that and he wants to put some wholeness into your life. Friend, that's who we are today. We're, we've been made whole, amen. That's what Jesus said to the woman there when, when he spoke to her. He said, do you want to be made whole? Your faith has made you whole. Not just, uh, you know, just a little bit of a dab will do. This is how Jesus trained his disciples. He would do great miracles like turning water into wine. Can you imagine that day when, when he was with those guys and, and there was this time there when he said, go and fill the water pots up with water. They knew what they filled those water pots up with. They filled them up with water and he says, okay, now go and serve it. 
He thought, man, we start serving these guys water, they're going to wipe us out. But you see, as they started to serve it, out came wine. Amazing things. He turned water into wine. He healed the sick. He fed the 5,000 with five loaves and, and, and a few fish. He raised the dead. And then, and then he said to them, just people like you and me, he said, you can do that. <laughs> the natural mind could not conceive as they were watching God or as they were watching this man, this miracle man, performing these great miracles. And all of a sudden, Jesus just turned around and says in John 14 and 12, he says, these things that I do, you can do also. I want to put it back onto you that you can also do this if you try. I, I believe Jesus was trying to break the natural law that screams out at us. When we talk about the supernatural presence, the supernatural power, when we start talking about the anointing that can break the yoke, when we start talking about what God can do in our land and how God wants to move and do things like that, the natural mind screams at us and, and says, that can't happen. It'll never, ever happen. Jesus wants to uh, uh, break that stronghold that says you can't do it into a, a, a word that comes out of your mouth that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, we've got to change the way we speak. There's a spiritual law I spoke about last week that few of us realize it's our confessions rule us. It's how you speak rule us. Jesus carried the anointing and he spoke as one having authority. That's what separated Jesus from the rest of the world. He spoke as one having authority. He said to the legion of demons, come out, and they did. <laughs> Can you imagine being around that, that day, amen, when thousands of demons came out? He said to the dead girl, arise, and she did. Anybody else got anything you want to add to that list? I guarantee there's so many things. I could go on and on and on about things that, that, that Jesus did. Crying about why you got sick won't fix a thing. Taking authority over it will. And I believe that's what Jesus wants us to do as a church, as a people. I'm not just talking about this church, but Christians. There's only one church on the Sunshine Coast. We might meet in many locations, but there's one church. And Jesus wants his church to rise up and start speaking what he says and not what the natural law in your mind says that it'll never happen. I want to tell you, we will see a move of the Spirit of God. We're going to see what God says He's going to do on this planet. Amen. We're going to see, I, I believe, amazing things. Crying about why you're sick will not help at all. But taking authority over it, standing there, and just believing God, I believe that will. The righteous can tap into the power, the anointing, and the authority of God. It's tapping into this. It's, it's somehow or other tapping into it. I remember Fran, as she's told stories many times, and here was a woman that was hungry for God. Anybody hungry for God? You ever hungry for God? And she was in her bedroom, crying out to God, hungry for God. And all of a sudden, she tapped into something so dynamic and so powerful that her life would never be the same again. As she was in that room, I'm telling your story here. But as she, she was in that bedroom, walking around, all of a sudden, she was baptized in the Holy Spirit and began to speak in another language and started to enter into the presence of God. And God started to talk to her. God started to share things with her. And it led her into a destiny where today, many, many people, when we get to heaven, are going to stand up and call you blessed. Amen. That's what it's all about, friends. We're not here just to, to, to warm a pew. We are here to get up off our blessed assurance and do something for God. Amen. Jesus carried that anointing. He spoke those words. He spoke to the legions and they did come out. Crying about things won't help but taking authority. You and I can tap in to this power, this anointing and this authority. God's righteousness takes us into a dimension that breaks the power of the natural thinking, of the natural mind or the natural law, into authority that makes you more than a conqueror. See, Jesus spoke words like this. He said, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. 
didn't say you're going to have to make yourself a fisher of men. But I believe that when we, the people of God, somehow or other tap into that, that unction, that anointing, and friend, you will never do it by sitting around playing church, but you will, as you push through the obstacles, strongholds will be broken. Things that around your mind will be smashed and broke down. But I want to tell you, as we, as we stand, it doesn't matter whether the music's in or out of tune, but it's you and I touching God, reaching out, hungry for God, wanting to tap into that supernatural power of God that will make you more than a conqueror. That will make you more than a conqueror. Not just talking about it. But I want to tell you, we've been talking about things too long. It's time for action. Amen? It's time to become the church. It's time to be what God wants us to be. Every one of us have been infused with the God-given power and purpose. You, you are saturated, impregnated. You've got to know this today, amen. I, I am not just a normal person anymore. I was a, a mere man, but this mere man got filled and touched by a supernatural being. Something on the inside of me that changed my life forever. Hallelujah. The supernatural power of God. The, I am impregnated. I am marinated. <laughs> oh. How many people like something marinated? Amen. You know what I found out? You can marinate a fillet steak. You can marinate a rump. You can marinate a boot leather. They'll all taste the same. They might be just a little bit tougher. <laughs> but they'll all taste the same because it's a marinate. We've been marinated. We've been, we've been impregnated. You must know today, you're not only made by God, but you are made for God. How many times have you heard me say that over the years? We're not just made by God, but we were made for God. Hallelujah. I am a God kind of person. We are God's people. You must know today that that's what God has for you. God has his own divine purpose for your life. For a man to, to find or a woman to find the divine purpose of God for your life is the greatest thing you will ever find. Amen. It's more precious than gold. It's more precious than rubies. It's more precious than anything else you could ever have. It's the greatest find you'll ever find is the purpose and plan that God has for your life. And then go after it in Jesus' name. Amen. Go after it. In Jeremiah 1.5, this is an amazing scripture. It says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you or set you apart. Before I was born, I was set apart. Before you were born, you were set apart by God for God. Amen. And he has a purpose for your life. In this case, in Jeremiah, he said, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. In other words, ordained or I appointed you as a prophet. I started out as a carpenter. I praise God, that's not where I finished. You might have started life somewhere. Some of these kids might have started life ready to tumble over into, into the abyss. Some of these kids might have just... But I want to tell you, that is not God's plan for their life. Amen? God's plan for their life is greatness. God's plan for their life is to be carriers of the anointing of God, to manifest the power of God. What an amazing thing. I started out as a carpenter. <laughs> you have a God-given purpose. I want you to touch somebody on the shoulder and say, you have a God-given purpose. I, I want you to say this. He's talking about you. <laughs> He's talking about you, not somebody else. Some people think it's too late. Joshua's purpose was to take God's people into the promised land. He was 85. I believe somewhere around about that anyhow. Caleb's destiny was to take the mountain. Amen. He was about 85 as well. My destiny 
is unfinished business on the Sunshine Coast. I'm only a pimp. I'm only 77. Hallelujah. i got another 10 good years at least. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. What's your purpose? What's God's purpose for your life? Are you going to waste your life going after rainbows, scratchets, lotto? No, no. There's only one way, and that's to plug in to the dynamic dimension of God's power and let Him flow through you. You have to fight the natural instinct and go where God wants you to go. In the Spirit, it says it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my Spirit. Jesus is the prototype. You think it was just that? No, He was the prototype. And you know what? God gets great delight, great delight out of producing literally thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Jesus-like people on this planet. Is it okay to say that? He doesn't want just a bunch of people going to church singing lullabies. He wants a bunch of people to get in the fire of God. Amen. Folks. Jesus is the prototype. What are you going to do with what God's given you? 